Hello folks, today we're going to be going through the upgrade of Technotool Nova Voyager DVR drill press from its original Morse taper number two to a newer uh, Morse taper number three in combination with uh, ER32 call it system. Some of you may know that Technotool more recently than this model released a, another drill press slash nail called a Vulcan. Ever since I got this, I'm pretty happy with this machine. Of course, Morse Taper is a bit flimsier than Morse Taper 3, so when I heard that there is a newer model, I uh, started wondering what are the differences between them. And reviewing the blueprints for both machines, I discovered that there's really not too much difference. The actual head unit, the pillar, the base, everything is really identical. Comparing the manual covers, I can only really spot two differences between these two models. The table on the Voyager is a little bit larger than on the Vulcan. And the style of table is different. This is clearly more of a woodworking style. And this one has grooves. They're claiming for coolant and all that. Now let's look at the inventory of what's in the box for each model. Again, left is the Voyager, right is the Vulcan. I'm going to just overlap them, delete the parts that are the same, and move the difference back out. So you can see the table is different, uh, the table skew is different, the arbor is different. Everything from position 17 through 21 is different. So this one includes ER32 collet nut, ER32 collet, the coolant hose, the hose connector to drain the table, and the ER32 collet spanner. There is uh, a couple of differences uh, in the specs. The spindle to table minimum and maximum distances uh, seem to be different, but I think that's just related to the thickness of the tables. Uh, and what else? Spindle to base distance is different. And of course, the main difference that interests us in this case is that the Voyager has more Staper 2 and the Vulcan has more Staper 3. All right, let's do the same thing with the headstock breakdown. Let me just move it back out. You can clearly see that it's just the spindle assembly. And now on to the fun part, the parts list. Take the one from Vulcan, overlap it, with the Voyager, then simply move out the difference so we can clearly see it. Interesting. Part 16 through 19, here we just have a six inch spindle and have six inch three more staper slash Jacob staper 33 spindle here. Ball bearing and ball bearing, but if you look closely the parts are different 6203 and 6023 very close but not the same more staper 3 arbor here and here they just call it arbor but we know that it's more staper 2 a drill press quill an engineering drill press quill without the actual part number i suspect that all of that is part of the same spindle and quill sub assembly that is not even marked on the Voyager's list. Angular contact ball bearing instead of just ball bearing. And then metal working table instead of woodworking table. Hose connect connector that comes with it. And a coolant hose that's nowhere to be found on this side. Those are all the differences. So I'm glad that they saved me time by uh, making parts available. I got the kit uh, from them, it's actually labeled 
drill press 2MT, which is number two Morse paper slash ER32 spindle set, which is incorrect. I know for a fact that it's Morse paper three. And uh, this, this, uh, this is the taper that came with it. It also give you the ER32 wrench for ER32 collets. It's a combination unit. We're gonna go over it in more detail a little bit later on. So today I'm gonna to go through the entire sequence. I'm gonna show you the total indicator run out or TIR on the original paper. We're gonna actually start with that. And then we're gonna go through the entire upgrade sequence. So if you have any comments or questions, of course, uh, post them down below. Some of the tools that we will need today are uh, needle nose pliers just to retain the, the spring as it unleashes. It's not really the official way of doing it. You could conjure up a tool, basically a disc with a slot that goes on top of this captive cover. The outside diameter of this is two inches, 600,000, so a little bit over two and a half. I didn't feel like milling a retaining tool. The spring should be okay to hold on with just middle nose pliers. Phillips screwdriver to undo the screw here down here at the bottom. Five millimeter Allen wrench, flat pliers, um, taper drift to take the, the old taper out. Little dead blow mallet. Before we really dive into it, I just wanted to show how much of a total indicator ran out or TIR the original Morse number two taper had. So here we still have the Morse taper two mounted as the drill came originally. I don't have a ground bar of those of the dimensions that would fit in this check. So I'm just using a 5 8 carbide end mill that was never gripped around that area. So it's uh, fair to say it's uh, pretty round. This indicator right here, every tick is five tenths or five ten thousandths. So I already dialed it in. I'm just gonna go ahead and slowly rotate it. And as you can see it, the, the needle at its extreme kisses the two thousandths of an inch position barely. So I can actually see it's more like 18, 19 tenths. That is the original taper. Step one, we're gonna release the old taper to make sure that it doesn't fall out. To do that, we unlock the quill, lower it down enough for the quill opening to, to be exposed, and rotate the spindle manually to make sure that you can see the end of the taper using the drift and a dead blow hammer. Just a little blow and it's released. Oops. Next thing, we're gonna get this portion of the assembly out. Step two, just to make sure that it's out of our way. For that, you will need a five millimeter Allen wrench. Release the screw. Let it go. Get this nut off. Take this off. Step number three, remove the cover. There is a wound up coil spring inside that controls the motion of the quill up and down and responsible for retraction. So you have to be careful to make sure that it doesn't jump out at you. Using the needle nose pliers, I'm going to insert them in such a way where safely prevent the rotation and then I'm going to loosen these two nuts right here with the channel lock pliers. Just enough so that I can turn them by hand. A little more. There we go. I'm just loosening them up, but I am not removing them just yet. So first we have to let the spring do its thing. Using the Phillips screwdriver, coming underneath and while securely holding the spring, I'm undoing this screw all the way. 
Now that it's safely out of my way, I'm going to release the these two nuts to the point where I can remove them by hand. Put them on the side and then let the spring unwind. So that, that, that was really fast. All you have to do now is just wiggle it off. It's inserted into this pre-cut slotted bolt assembly. So just wiggle it, wiggle it and take it off. That's how it looks inside. So now it's, it's released state. Now I can and I should lock the quill all the way just so that it does not pop out because the next thing we're going to remove is the uh, part of the assembly that controls the up and down motion of the quill. Okay, so for the next step, I'm going to lower down the table so that I have enough clearance for the entire spindle assembly to come out. I'm going to hold on to it securely with one hand while releasing this screw with the other and then I'm gonna just let it slide using both gravity and gently wiggling it out. So you have to be careful. And this part we are going to reuse. This is just a rubber washer that prevents the bottom portion of this assembly from banging against the cast iron part. We're gonna do a couple of things before we put the new spindle assembly back into the head. I'm going to take a little bit of whey lube oil and lightly grease the outside diameter and use the old rubber gasket that, that was mounted on the, the old spindle, lower it down into this position, insert the, the spindle and orient it so that this positioning groove is facing three o'clock position. Um, there's a captive screw that goes into this groove. So a little bit of gentle wiggling and it's in its proper position. So it stops at some point and cannot go up higher because the splines on the spindle have to line up with the receiving part. So all you do is you gently rotate the lower portion of the spindle by hand until you feel that it's going in correctly. At this point, it's ready to go all the way in. I'm going to take the wheel, put it through. Again, kind of use your judgment, don't just crack, cram it in. Wiggle it and find the position where it meshes correctly with the teeth on the spindle. So a quick check, it goes up and down. All right. So at this point, I'm going to lock completely and uh, put the spring back on. If you look at the spring, it has a vertical portion in the center that gets inserted into the, the slot in the, in the screw. So make sure that you find the position. and wiggle it back on in order to wind this spring back up correctly it, it will have to make uh, three quarters to one full revolution and in order to achieve that just think where this portion of the spring will wind up after you tighten it i want this edge to give me leverage so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-position my screw in into its original hole. But I'm not going to screw it in completely. I'm just going to have it in the position where I can have this cover, one of the slats, go and be captured by, by the screw. 
So I get it, I wiggle it as close as I can, however, leaving it in a position where I can still manipulate the spring. And so now, here's my about half a rev. Now that I have the spring in the right position, I'm just gonna go ahead and tighten the Phillips screw at the bottom, making sure that is uh, positioned inside one of the slots in the cover. Once that is done, and I don't want it too tight, but uh, basically almost all the way there, then I can slowly and gently let the, the spring go and start putting the, the, the nuts back on. first and uh, here goes the second at first just hand tight and I want to loosen uh, the lock and make sure that the spring and has enough tension to return the quill entire way up then I'm gonna start tightening the, the nuts a little more making making sure again that the spring has enough tension to return the quill completely once I get to the point where it doesn't return it all the way, I'm just going to back off uh, a little bit. At this point, now that everything's working, I'm going to put the, the height setter back. So just going to put it through. Okay. Put that nut on. And, uh, Make sure that I position this rod uh, in the middle of its hole. Tighten up the M5. That's held securely in place right now. The next order of business is we're gonna uh, go ahead and take the ER nut and the collet that it came with, which is by the way, 18, 17 millimeters. Uh, they only give you one. Now what we have is the same exact 5.8 carbide end mill in the same exact Morse taper chuck. Without too much effort, you can see that it's deviating less than 5 tenths. So that's half a thou TIR. Pretty good results.